Good morning. Um, one quick housekeeping announcement, and then I will um, have the pleasure of introducing um, this morning's distinguished lecturer to you. So the housekeeping bit is that we're going to have um, a, an, a, an unusual, un, un, unscheduled, somewhat special Grand Rounds the last Wednesday of November, the 29th. Uh, we happen to have in town uh, Claire Gillen, a UK researcher who's been doing some very interesting uh, research actually over the internet with you know hundreds of participants uh, using computational psychiatry to investigate uh, some of the information processing that uh, kind of, uh, what would you say, kind of differences in people with OCD or OCD type um, traits, and I um, urge you all to come because it's kind of a it's a window into um, an important new research area that's going to be dominating uh, the field over the over the coming years. So come and hear Claire speak. She's a very good speaker, and her her work is very very interesting. Um, because of her schedule and some other scheduling things, that uh, special grand rounds will happen not at our usual 11 a.m. time, but it'll happen at uh, 12.30 on that Wednesday, and you'll be getting announcements about it, but just wanted to let you know about that. Um, so um, now I have, as I said, the, the immense pleasure of welcoming Dr. Keith Nuchterlein here as our distinguished visiting lecturer. Um, and, you know, Dr. Nuchterlein's accomplishments, you know, uh, are filling up in tiny font this page. I'll, I'll just highlight a few of them, and then I'm going to tell you a little bit more of a, of a sort of more personal note um, about what it's been like to work with, with Keith and, and have him as, as a colleague in this field. So Dr. Nuchterlein is the Distinguished Professor in the Departments of Psychiatry and Biobehavioral Sciences and Psychology at UCLA and Director of the UCLA Aftercare Research Program, which is a research clinic devoted to research and treatment with patients who have experienced a recent onset of schizophrenia. He also served as the director of the UCLA Center for Neurocognition and Emotion and Schizophrenia from 2003 to 2016, and it's safe to say that the work coming out of that center essentially revolutionized how we think about um, key areas of investigation and treatment for schizophrenia. Uh, what's kind of more fun is that Dr. Nuchterlein received his BA in psychology and his PhD in psychology, clinical psychology, here from the University of Minnesota, and he's a son of the Midwest. Um, and he actually uh, spent his formative years uh, here in the Twin Cities um, area. He's written more than 290 journal articles and scientists on the ISI Web of Knowledge as highly cited, uh, most highly cited list for psychology and psychiatry. He's been on editorial boards for, for numerous um, journals, prestigious journals. He's received numerous uh, and continuous research grant funding from NIMH and other sor sources. Um, and he's been really kind of a, a giant in the field. I have to say, you know, uh, we were talking about it at dinner um, uh, yesterday evening, and the other thing is he comes from this class of amazing uh, kind of clinical uh, psychologists who also had these inc distinguished research careers uh, here at the University of Minnesota, and this, you know, this, this group of people who were training in the 70s who went on, Dr. Nuchterlein, uh, Dr. Dante Cicchetti, and Dr. Bill Iacono, who really each in their own way uh, essentially revolutionized each of their fields. Uh, there was some magic going on at that time, both in terms of who they were recruited and the raw talent and how you were trained. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to learn more about some of um, And I'll also say, we were chatting uh, here just now about um, you know, how to bring in great faculty and to create collaborative research environments. And, and Dr. Nuchterlein was saying that one of his principles is to make sure that the people you bring into your research group are people who are highly collaborative and, and foster both um, a kind of a, a cross scientists and across disciplines um, uh, investigations. And I think the fact that that pays off and you only have to look at his publication list to, to see what kinds of contributions that approach will, will make. You know, I could go on the list. He's, uh, Dr. Nuchterlein has received a number of awards, including the Zubin Lifetime Achievement Award by the Society for Research in Psychopathology, uh, the Trailblazer Award by the ABCT Special Interest Group on Schizophrenia, the Kraepelin Alzheimer Medal at the University of Munich. Um, but as I said, I want to just tell you a little bit of, of, of the, the personal side. So even as a very young um, kind, of, uh, kind of research trainee, I was aware, of course, of Dr. Nuchterlein's seminal work, particularly in exploring cognitive dysfunction, attentional dysfunction um, in schizophrenia. It's work that I read, that I studied, that I thought about a lot as I was becoming interested in cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. 
I, of course, then also became aware of the um, seminal role that he played in developing the matrix uh, consensus, uh, the consensus battery for um, coming up with a uh, thoughtful evidence-based approach that could be used in a standardized and systematic manner, manner across studies to assess cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. Again, I think it's safe to say a practice which really has changed how we approach uh, aspects of study design in schizophrenia. Um, and, you know, so he was one of those sort of luminaries out there um, whose work I had admired for many, many years. And then we just had the chance to start interacting um, around some ideas. Um, uh, in uh, Dr. Nuchterlein had begun to um, do work with first episode psychosis, um, looking at different kinds of treatment approaches, including treatments for the cognitive dysfunction, looking at cognitive training and cognitive remediation methods. That brought us into the same circle. We began exchanging ideas and talking. And, you know, to my somewhat delight and, and shock, here was this, as I said, you know, luminary in the field who was approachable, thoughtful, had a great sense of humor, wonderful advice, um, loved to share ideas. Um, and I can, I, I can just tell you, it's been kind of one of the real pleasures of, of um, this, this phase of my career to get to know Dr. Nuchterlein and his work better, to be on, to go to meetings together and to, to continue to, to learn and grow from his ideas. Um, so there's a real kind of personal pleasure in welcoming you here, as well as, of course, um, just the, the thrill in bringing you back to the University of Minnesota. Well, thank you, Sophia. That was very gracious. Um, and I thank you for um, both the professional and the personal introduction. Um, uh, in addition to thanking Sophia for, um, for inviting me back um, to a place that I still sort of consider home. I was here during most of my childhood. Um, I, I just want to acknowledge the recent passing of Chuck Scholes. Um, he, um, he was a major influence on our field. I went, I think I've been to every international congress on schizophrenia research meeting that has existed. And uh, his organizational skills for that were quite remarkable. Um, <clears throat> Uh, one other um, sort of historical note for me is um, after I took abnormal psychology here as an undergraduate, um, I became interested in um, schizophrenia, major mental illness, at least at a theoretical level. And I sought work to actually meet patients with schizophrenia at Fairview Hospital. Um, in the old Fairview Hospital here 40 years ago, I was an orderly and uh, spent many hours with uh, schizophrenia patients, bipolar patients, depression patients. And it really kind of made me realize I, first of all, I like these individuals. I thought they were fascinating. I, um, it really got me to dedicate a career to that field. Um, finally, on a personal note, um, uh, I should tell you that at my first episode clinic um, in um, at Los Angeles, the rumor was going around yesterday that I was actually flying back to Minnesota to go trick or treating at home. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so on to the science. Um, so I'm going to speak to you today about. Um, studies where we've trying to, we're trying to advance uh, the effectiveness of treatment in first episode schizophrenia. And um, I will touch on these three topics about long-acting antipsychotics, cognitive training, and aerobic exercise. Um, this research is uh, mostly funded by various NIMH grants um, for some of the long-acting injectable medication support. Um, uh, we also uh, had supplemental support from Janssen. Um, the, um, the typical course of, um, of first episode schizophrenia um, is that after a major episode, if you are successfully treating the episode, the psychotic sy symptoms usually go into full remission for quite a number of months. Um, particularly if the people stay on their medication and in therapy. Um, but everyday function, every, even when you um, successfully get all the psychotic symptoms into remission, it usually remains impaired. 
And um, as I'll show you in a moment, it looks like work school functioning is particularly resistant to recovery. Um, clinically, a big problem is relapses during the first year or two are very common, uh, maybe even the dominant um, outcome. We looked at some data that we had collected back in the 80s and early 90s, and when we wondered which areas uh, tended to, to not recover as well as other areas, we looked at about a first episode patients. And what we found if we used a six-month period of good outcome during the first year, that actually 100% of our patients were not rehospitalized for at least six months. Um, disorganization symptoms were very rare. Um, we could get reality, just the psychotic symptoms, under control and disappeared uh, from clinical relevance at least um, in at least two-thirds of the cases. Uh, negative symptoms in about half. They were somewhat more resistant. Um, social functioning at the level of do you at least have some friends and some social interactions returned in 60%, but work functioning, only 38% actually did any useful work or went back to school at all, even um, at very minimal levels within the first year. So we um, were already interested in work school functioning, but we found these data to further point out how important that area was and relatively uh, untreated um, by older treatments. Um, we ask ourselves in that earlier sample, um, what predicts who goes back to work or school um, nine months after uh, they're stabilized on medication and outpatients? And after evaluating these various factors, we found that um, three cognitive factors uh, predicted remarkably well. Um, this is like a correlation of 0.7 something. 52% um, of the variance predicted by working memory, attention and perceptual processing, and verbal memory and processing speed. So it seems that these cognitive, these lasting, enduring cognitive factors are the main uh, influence on, uh, on the ability side of what's holding the patients back, even if they go into full uh, psychotic remission. Um, so we've been working for the last uh, about 15 years on various approaches to improving the cognitive deficits in schizophrenia. Um, and I'll uh, talk today about results that we have on these three approaches. Um, one is early in the illness, uh, consistency of antipsychotic medication, uh, taking it regularly, that is, seems to matter. Um, cognitive training we'll talk about, and uh, aerobic exercise. So uh, both um, directly biological and psychosocial approaches um, to the uh, problems early after a first episode. For those of us who've treated lots of first episode patients, it's striking how big a problem medication non-adherence is. Um, this is a summary for Wyden, um, of not just first episode patients, but early in the illness. Um, half of the patients go off their meds altogether or are off for substantial periods of time, even within one year, 75% within two years. And about half of all direct medical costs of um, psychiatric uh, illness of schizophrenia are attributed to uh, hospitals are attributable to non-adherence, which leads to hospitalization. So it's a huge um, problem, uh, both for those of us treating the illness, for society, for the individuals whose lives are disrupted. So one thing we did early on is uh, we were treating everyone with oral antipsychotic medications during this period. And um, we simply looked at uh, those periods when people were consistently taking their oral 
antipsychotic medication and uh, those periods where they not. And not surprisingly, um, uh, the um, people uh, during periods when they were taking their antipsychotic medication didn't relapse all that often, but um, still by the end of uh, this uh, period, um, still about half of them relapsed. Um, but if you went through periods where you were notably uh, non-adherent, um, you were almost certain to relapse. Um, so we, um, uh, and we discovered in this study that even periods that were very brief, like um, you were taking two-thirds of your meds, uh, we were using low-dose strategies, even taking like two-thirds of your meds and skipping a few days here and there, um, that had a dramatic effect on relapse risk. So we got interested um, in long-acting injectable medication. Um, traditionally, long-acting injectable medication is not used until you you failed a few times to um, take oral medication and had relapses. Um, I think of using it that way as the punishment paradigm. It's sort of like, um, gee, you were a bad patient. You you didn't take your meds. Now we're going to get out the big gun and give you the shot. Um, not surprisingly, most punishments are not well liked by uh, the individuals being punished. Um, and that hasn't always been a successful strategy. Um, but with first episode patients, there are experiences that they're remarkably accepting of long-acting injectable medication as an alternative. In this study, this was a two-by-two two design where people were, after a first episode, randomized to oral risperidone or long-acting injectable risperidone. And we were also interested at the same time in uh, cognitive remediation and, um, and as a control group, healthy behavior training. So we were trying both um, uh, medication and, and training-based uh, interventions to see if we could improve the, um, the course of schizophrenia. So this was a 12-month trial. Um, uh, we um, admitted people right after their first episode, stabilized them for about two or three months um, to get them out of the acute psychotic state. Uh, where they could uh, meaningfully um, participate in psychosocial group-based interventions and then um, randomize them to those four cells. And uh, all of the patients received uh, supported education, supported employment using this model called individual placement and support. Um, that was to provide a context of active rehabilitation because we thought that anything else we did to improve um, cognition uh, would probably have its effect on everyday life better if we had a context of actively supporting going back to work or school. So, <clears throat> so in this, <coughs> we, um, we looked at several different outcomes. So first of all, on the... Um, long-acting injectable versus oral side. Uh, some of you may know these results published in JAMA a couple years ago. Um, we found a dramatic effect on reducing relapse. So the one-year relapse risk on oral medication in our study was 33%, which is actually below what is typical in clinical practice, probably because we were paying such careful attention to all of our patients, but it was only 5% in over a one-year period for the patients on the long-acting version. So um, re worked remarkably well for relapse uh, rates. Hospitalization was also reduced from 18% to 5%, so a lot of cost savings and a lot of savings in disruption to um, the per individual's lives and their family's lives. Um, <clears throat> we also were interested in, from the beginning, in whether the effects of long-acting medication 
would actually be broader than the traditional uh, goal of reducing uh, psychotic symptoms and relapse. And we used um, the matrix consensus cognitive battery in this study that um, we had just developed with um, a, a contract from NIMH working with the FDA um, and uh, looked at that so that it could be compared to many other clinical trials that use that battery. And borrowing from, uh, some of you know, the Naples project um, studying prodromal or clinical high-risk subjects, it developed a, a functional outcome scale that's nicely applicable across the adolescent to, to actually aged age range, so um, that fit our young adult population. The matrix battery has these um, seven domains, um, each measured by one or more tests. And what we found when we looked at the patients um, treated with long-acting injectable versus oral risperidone is that by six months there were um, advantages, even cognitively, to um, long-acting injectable medication. Here divided just into were you on uh, randomly assigned to oral or long-acting injectable, it's significant by six months for ver verbal learning, almost so for the overall composite and working memory. And what we realized when we looked at these data um, was that uh, some of the people on oral meds were actually taking their medication very consistently, um, but many were not. So we also fortunately had a, a dimensional rating of their non-adherence that allowed us to fine tune this distinction. So it went from a one to five scale and we had, we were very elaborate about this. We had plasma levels every month, pill counts, um, these electronic caps that you put on medication bottles that told you when people took off the cap. And we were figuring out that only a few patients knew enough to take the cap off and put it back on without taking any medication. Um, <clears throat> but um, uh, so we put those all together and we had this dimension of adherence, non-adherence. And what we found is that was even more sensitive than simply the dichotomy, long-acting injectable versus oral. And now we got significant relationships with the average, the overall composite of cognition, uh, working memory, verbal learning, and social cognition was in the right direction and close. So, um, Clearly, um, long-acting injectable medication, at least early in psychosis, um, has a broader effect than just preventing psychotic symptoms from returning. Um, it does affect cognitive, cognitive recovery. Um, and we ask ourselves, um, was there generalization to everyday functioning, because cognition is related to everyday functioning, and indeed, it was. And we got better um, outcomes for work school functioning um, on long-acting injectable versus oral. So we were curious, especially with a, um, a psychiatrist, George Bartsokis, about um, what are the potential brain processes being affected here. Um, we found that um, a um, a uh, myelination in the lower levels of the cortex, which we call intracortical myelin, was correlated with cognitive performance in these patients. Um, and uh, you're wondering if you haven't read these papers, what in the world is intracortical myelin? So let me explain. George Bartsokas developed a specialized technique where he contrasts uh, two sequences in the uh, MRI sequences. Uh, one um, proton density is sensitive to traditional white and gray, gray matter distinctions. Another one, um, inversion recovery, is uh, sensitive to myelin itself. Even myelin that's in the lower levels of what we would traditionally consider the gray matter cortex. So we're looking here at the area between the red line and the white line in this, um, in this slide. 
And where um, that's myelination in the lower levels of the cortex rather than traditional white matter or white matter tracks or um, people who study DTI study uh, lower, longer tracks. This is not that. This is like local communication in that area of the cortex. And we found that in this six-month trial uh, pilot study um, with MRI that um, being on long-acting injectable on the right here um, as opposed to oral actually preserved and somewhat increased that intracortical myelin, whereas the usual course, if you follow people on oral meds for longer than this period, is they don't change right at the beginning, but then they, the intracortical myelin starts decreasing at an abnormally rapid rate over the first few years of the illness. So it looks like being on consistent uh, antipsychotic medication helps to preserve intracortical myelin. So we conclude that um, early in the illness, <clears throat> at least in the first year that we were studying, consistent antipsychotic medication, it contributes um, not only to fewer psychotic relapses, but also to improve cognitive functioning and role functioning. And it appears that intracortical myelin uh, may be a biological uh, marker for this process. Um, that it's preserved or even improved with consistent antipsychotic medication. So in this same study, remember that it was a two by two, and we were studying cognitive training effects. Um, uh, a, a little side story when um, about my first awareness of Sophia. Um, Sophia probably doesn't know that when she first put in a pilot grant when she was at UCF, UCSF, I was one of the reviewers, and um, uh, but I, and I don't really know what happened to this, but I not it was a very nice uh, one of your early um, piloting a few subjects to see if positive science uh, cognitive training would work. And um, I looked at the very early feasibility stuff, and I not only said she should get the grant, I said she didn't have enough subjects. They should give her more money so she could, so she could uh, get even more subjects. Um, so, uh, you know, I was impressed with wor her work from the very beginning. Um, you know, all of these studies of um, cognitive training they depend on the basic plasticity of the brain. And of course, um, we all know that we can learn things um, even when we're adults and, uh, and even moving towards aged. But um, we, um, we don't really always think about the underlying processes. And um, they increase uh, the ability to have uh, synapses form and, and become consolidated, certainly early in life, but throughout life. And cognitive training takes advantage of that. Um, in the first study we did, um, we were um, interested in um, combining existing approaches. Um, some of the approaches at that time, this is like uh, 10 years ago we started this study, um, uh, some of the approaches um, use so-called bottom-up, starting with very simple cognitive processes and moving to higher level processes. Other pr approaches believe that you could just intervene at the high level, like problem solving, um, complex reasoning level, and that, uh, to the extent that there were problems at lower levels, that would take care of the problems at the lower levels. Um, and you didn't have to directly start with the lower levels. We weren't totally satisfied with either of those approaches, um, realizing that in schizophrenia the, the core deficits are really multiple and they're at, um, at many different levels. Um, wasn't quite clear how to best reach them. So we combined the two approaches, um, one represented by Morris Bell and his colleagues at Yale, and the other by Alice Medallia, who was then at Columbia. Um, 
and um, no, now is at Columbia. Um, and uh, this was what I consider cognitive remediation light um, these days um, because it was only two hours a week of cognitive training, plus a bridging group where we tried to get people to move what they learned in the, in the cognitive training to everyday life. Um, we started, this um, used 23 different programs over a one-year period, and um, uh, we started with very basic um, uh, tasks and um, moved through processing speed, attention, uh, working memory, uh, into more complex levels of memory and categorization, associative memory, then low-level problem solving, um, and uh, moved to higher-level problem solving. Um, and this became in sort of game-like tasks that were more and more like real life. Um, in Ice Cream Truck, for example, a great name for, you know, uh, a uh, serious research on cognitive remediation, right? Um, in Ice Cream Truck, you had to um, imagine that you were setting up a business um, and you it was an ice cream truck business and that you had to decide things like um, where should the truck go, how much ice cream should you order, how would you advertise, what should you set as the price, and you got feedback based on trying this, and then you were asked to alter your uh, choices to become a successful ice cream truck driver. Um, I was never very good at that, so I became a professor, but, um, <laughs> but it was uh, a useful skill, we thought. Um, we compared that to um, healthy behavior training. And uh, we were interested initially in the physical health complications of schizophrenia and the uh, side effects of second generation antipsychotic treatment. So we um, used an equal amount of time in healthy behavior training. It had three components, nutrition training, some exercise training, and relaxation and stress reduction. And we compared these. Um, now, at this point, we knew that that dimension of uh, medication adherence actually had an effect on cognitive recovery. So uh, we co-varied that, that dimension and whether people finished the protocol or not, we found a nice significant effect of cognitive training. And for those of you who know effect sizes, but you're used to Cohen's D, for Cohen's F, that's for an interaction. You have to multiply it by two. So this is like a Cohen's D of um, 0.75 range and a large effect. Um, so. Uh, even after, and actually it helps refine the effect of looking for cognitive training by controlling for medication adherence, um, we found that effect on cognition. And it did also, just like uh, staying on your meds consistently, it led to um, a greater everyday role functioning at work and school. So we were very pleased with that. Uh, this is uh, almost a large effect, kind of medium. Uh, to large. Um, so we were pleased with that. At the same time, we recognized that um, that's, there's still a ways to go. The, the deficit in schizophrenia is like a standard deviation and a half on cognition. We were probably moving people uh, like a quarter to a third towards um, normal level. But we wondered whether the um, cognitive um, functioning was related to the role functioning because we thought that's why role functioning was improving. Um, we at least found a significant, if not r terribly high, correlation between the amount of cognitive improvement and the amount of role functioning. So um, we conclude about this area um, that indeed cognitive remediation can produce significant gains in overall cognitive performance. Um, relative to this active control group. Um, and it was especially sensitively detected when we controlled for the effect of medication adherence and whether people completed the protocol. Um, 
these effect sizes were, as I just said, medium to large, um, still leaving a lot of uh, cognitive impairment um, uh, untouched, though. So it was good news, uh, but we had some place further to go. Um, here I'd like to highlight, uh, we got interested in the results from posit science programs because of the earlier um, results uh, that uh, Sophia and her group at UCSF had shown with chronic patients and they have more recently um, demonstrated in recent onset patients that um, using a version of the matrix battery that indeed the posit science um, neuroplasticity based cognitive training can indeed produce again um, moderate um, but significant and clinically meaningful improvements in cognition um, and uh, in this case particularly verbal memory and problem solving. So we were encouraged by that, became fascinated with the posit science um, approach to this. Um, and at that time we were um, we were looking for ways to boost the effect. We thought, oh, both of these approaches, various approaches to cognitive remediation seem to work and get at least uh, medium effects. Um, that's very satisfying when, I mean, if you were um, at this point, if you were a pharmaceutical company, you would be like hip hip hooray, we're going off to the FDA and we're going to make millions of dollars because no cognitive enhancer so far has been approved by the FDA. There's no successful trials dis despite multiple attempts. Cognitive remediation very clearly is a successful attempt to change cognition in schizophrenia. Um, I'm waiting till we all get millions of dollars for showing this, but um, that might be a while. But in the meantime, we um, uh, decided we'll try to boost the effect. Now about halfway through that last study, you notice that exercise training was part of the control group. So I started reading the literature on exercise in healthy people. And to tell you the truth, it scared the heck out of me because um, the literature increasingly showed that exercise in healthy people led to improved cognition. And here I'm thinking, that's our control group. We put that there so it wouldn't change cognition, even if it did other good things for the patient. Um, so then we got interested in that literature. The evidence is actually fairly strong, uh, especially the animal literature, that aerobic exercise releases neurotrophic factors in the brain, especially BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, and it stimulates uh, synaptic plasticity, actually in animals' um, uh, new neuronal growth in certain areas of the brain, and enhances learning potential. The animal literature is also interesting in that the effects of aerobic exercise on cognition are, and on synaptogenesis and neurogenesis are very temporary if you don't put them in a cognitively stimulating environment. So you'll get these boosts that are potential for um, uh, permanent changes in the brain, but unless you then cognitively stimulate the animal, uh, it all goes back. It all uh, goes back to where it was. So we decided, um, gee, maybe a combination was a good idea. There were initial promising results from Pajank et al. in Germany and David Kimmy at, uh, at Columbia at that time. Um, and they used aerobic exercise alone with chronic uh, patients with schizophrenia and found some promising effects on cognition. Um, then uh, Baron Melchow in Germany tried a sequence of, first they did six weeks of exercise and then they added cognitive training. Um, that looked promising, but the results they got that were positive for cognition were when they added cognitive training. It was a little hard to tell whether that was just from the cognitive training or from the exercise plus cognitive training. 
we decided doing them concurrently was a better approach. And we decided, of course, we were already studying first episode patients, but we decided that studying first episode patients, we'd have a better chance to maximize gain cognitively and also generalization to everyday functioning is, I believe, easier in first episode patients. So we did another randomized controlled trial that we recently finished. Um, this was what NIMH considers a uh, randomized control, quote, pilot study. Still takes two or three years to do the pilot study. Um, the um, uh, one group got cognitive training for four hours a week uh, for six months, and um, the other group got the same cognitive training, plus they were in a systematic um, aerobic exercise program. Um, so for those of you who don't know the Posit Science programs, we used um, a combination of basic cognition, neurocognition, non-social cognition um, training, and social cognition training. And um, we focused, as did um, uh, Sophia and her group's earlier studies, on auditory discrimination, verbal memory, early forms of, of neurocognition. And it built up to higher levels. Um, and then Socialville was um, some of the same processes, but with social stimuli, emotions, faces, voices with emotional tone. Um, so examples of some of the um, training in this um, uh, exercise, you learn to discriminate um, uh, syllables that are close together, together, ha versus ga, and they become increasingly uh, difficult to discriminate as you get better and better at the task. The task adjusts automatically so that you have like a 75-80% uh, level of um, success, so it encourages your motivation. Um, in another one, uh, much like for those of you who remember concentration on television, um, you click on one of these, you hear the sound, the, like the syllable in the last one, and then you click on another one, you hear another sound, you have to remember where those sounds were. So you're using your working and spatial memory to remember the sounds and then uh, you match the sounds. Um, examples of the social uh, cognition training, um, you saw a face with a certain emotion, um, but it's not the same person. Then uh, you see this and you're asked to match the emotion you saw to the emotions you see on this person's face. Uh, this one, you see uh, multiple people and you're told things about them. And then you're asked, um, for this person, which of these three things characterize that person? So as you can see, um, it not only uses very basic um, cognitive skills, but it builds towards higher level cognitive skills. Um, and that whole set of programs was very um, much designed to um, promote um, the best principles of, of uh, neuroplasticity training, um, both from the animal and human research. So it seemed especially fitting to a situation where we are trying to, with aerobic exercise, promote um, uh, neuroplasticity and learning potential. Um, the exercise training we used, we used you know, on purpose um, exercises that you could do without going to the gym with specialized equipment because we think if we were successful, we wanted it to be possible to do this in the average um, community clinic. Um, uh, not all community clinics all year round could do this exercise outside, but um, uh, actually in, in our clinic, the problem is when it gets really warm, the patients c complain that it's too warm out and they, we have to move inside in the air conditioning so they can exercise hard enough. Um, the, um, so there's four, uh, four sessions of exercise a week. Two days, we bring them into the clinic, 45 minutes of exercise. We give them individually synced heart rate monitors, and we know what their individual 
um, heart rate capacity is, and they go for 60 to 80 percent of heart rate capacity during their exercise. For those of you who know the exercise literature or you go to your local parks, this is a version of what's called interval training or circuit training, um, where you exercise at a, vig at a moderate to vigorous level for like three minutes, then you take a, a break for like a minute, you do something else for about three minutes, and then you take a break and so on. It has the effect of keeping your heart rate um, sufficiently elevated in the right uh, range, and it is a very efficient form of exercise. Um, some things are like jumping jacks, other typical calisthenics. Um, we um, also mixed it with some strength conditioning effects, um, and that was done for 45 minutes twice a week in the clinic, and then they were assigned to do it um, two more times at home. The target was 150 minutes of exercise um, a week. Um, not everyone hit that target, but um, uh, actually, getting them to exercise in the clinic was pretty easy. We had like 80-85% um, adherence in the clinic, um, about 50 to 60% adherence at home. Um, I was really disappointed with that until I uh, read the literature, which said that in healthy adults in exercise programs, their uh, adherence is about 35%. Um, so then I started being happy that even with schizophrenia patients, you know, it's all cognitive reframing um, that we could actually reach 50 to 60 at home. Um, we um, have recently finished this study and find that um, both conditions, cognitive training alone and cognitive training and exercise, as we expected, do lead to significant improvement in cognition on that matrix of consensus cognitive battery. This is the overall score. Um, but um, adding exercise significantly speeds up the learning. Um, here it's about triple the amount of learning in the first three months. The other group gradually starts to catch up because they continue to improve, but not to the same extent. And uh, it's certainly much more efficient to uh, combine the two. We ask um, what areas uh, were especially affected. The largest effect, and by the way, this is um, Cohen's F of F. Cohen's F of four is like a Cohen's D of eight point eight. So this is definitely a large effect, differential effect. Here um, on reasoning and problem solving, executive functioning, um, some call this, um, again, a large differential effect. So adding aerobic exercise really helps. Um, then um, does it help everyday functioning as well? Again, both groups improve, but the group with the added aerobic exercise improved uh, much more than cognitive training alone. So again, a, a very large, in this case, uh, equivalent to a Cohen's D slightly over one. Um, we were interested in biological mechanisms again. Um, we did measure BDNF repeatedly, um, and we haven't finished the final assays on this, but the preliminary assays halfway through the study um, showed a increase in BDNF um, that was larger in the exercise group, increased in both groups, um, by even two weeks into the treatment. And if we looked across the groups and just said, how much BDNF increase did you have in the first two weeks, that predicted the amount of cognitive gain at the three-month point. So we were very pleased with that a possible biological mechanism. And then we looked at the cognitive gain at three months and um, looked at how that's related to functional uh, improvement. And we found it was not only related to concurrent functional improvement, but it predicted the amount of uh, actual everyday life uh, improvement at six months. So we were very pleased with those results. 
And um, fortunately, so is NIMH and gave us another grant to study five more years of this kind of phenomenon with slightly better uh, control group. Um, okay, finally, um, we were curious whether we could, with MRI, um, pick up cortical um, changes with the contrast between exercise um, addition and cognitive training alone. And um, this was done, I want to especially acknowledge Sarah McEwen. Um, this is her, the results of her K Award, a young faculty member at UCLA who's just recently moved to UCSD. Um, you can't even keep the good ones at home sometime. Um, but um, uh, she found that um, uh, we found differential increases in uh, left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, cortical thickness um, from baseline to six months in the, with the addition of exercise, and uh, right superior frontal gyrus increased cortical thickness. Um, but let's emphasize those. And um, then we correlated those changes with our cognitive and functional changes. And we found that the um, DLPFC improvement did correlate with the executive functioning or reasoning and problem solving gain in over the six month period. And the uh, superior frontal gyrus correlated with uh, our uh, role functioning, social functioning improvement. Um, one other thing um, Sarah did was looked at uh, resting um, fMRI and um, looked at uh, connectivity analyses, found that there was an effect of uh, greater functional connectivity between um, left and right um, central executive network and um, uh, with the addition of exercise. And we found that also predicted um, improvements in reasoning and problem solving. So um, these are sort of early pilot results from the MRI um, uh, imaging side, um, but they suggest that we're getting um, meaningful changes in um, cortical thickness and functional connectivity. So to, um, to get close to final conclusions here, for aerobic exercise, we would say, um, you know, adding uh, physical exercise to cognitive training really can notably improve the impact of cognitive training, which in and of itself has been very clearly demonstrated to be effective. Um, so it speeds up the learning. Um, when applied during the first episode, it also um, generalizes to everyday role functioning. And we find this promising mechanism of action, which uh, goes from increased BDNF at two weeks to increased cognition at three months to predicting role functioning at six months. So we're encouraged by that. Um, we um, are intrigued by um, that we're getting cortical thickness changes, especially left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and right superior frontal cortex, and that these changes plus the functional connectivity increase do seem to relate to the cognitive and functional improvements. So um, that was about 15 uh, years of research um, in 50 minutes. Um, it, so if anybody could do a quick calculation of how per minute, like what did we cover? but that was a lot of work of a big group. Um, we found that um, long-acting antipsychotic medication um, really has a larger impact than most people realize. Um, keeping first episode patients on their meds, if you can do it with oral, great, but it's easier with long-acting injectable meds. And um, it not only affects relapse risk, but cognition and functional outcome. Cognitive training can definitely improve cognition and work school functioning, even beyond the effects, uh, even when you control the effects of long-acting medication or medication adherence. Um, and um, 
adding aerobic exercise, which all our doctors tell us to exercise more, but if you have schizophrenia and cognitive deficits and um, you have access to cognitive training, you should definitely start an exercise routine. Um, even if you can't do 150 minutes, maybe 120, um, you know, anything you can do to do moderate to vigorous exercise a few times a week is likely to markedly boost your um, learning and uh, we'll see long term whether uh, it's a permanent effect or you have to keep exercising. It would not be a bad um, outcome if we had to keep exercising. We all suspect that that is what we have to do. Um, wanted to acknowledge this is the, uh, a, a very large collaborative team. Um, we're fortunate to have a very nice uh, collaborative group at UCLA. And as um, Sophia mentioned, when we have to replace someone, that's one of the main things we screen for is, are you not only a bright young person, but are you a good collaborator? Um, will you fit into the group and add something unique, but also um, do you play well with others? These people all play well with others. I wanted to thank you, um, and I hope you remember something at least um, tomorrow when we do the retest. Probably not directly, um, but um, you might be able to do other things like Sophia found in one study that even cognitive training alone, um, if done intensively enough, increases BDNF. So probably what we're doing is various ways of stimulating the brain um, do increase BDNF. Um, it's just that aerobic exercise is a particularly efficient, natural way to do that. I don't know that you can actually give BDNF directly. That's what I thought. Yeah. 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 So you'd have to do something that would cross the blood-brain barrier to get it into the um, the neurons that you care about. Yes, very good, and very practical question. Um, we. Um, not as part of the um, of the exercise study itself did we look at, you're thinking of intracortical white matter, yeah. intracortical myelin, um, but we actually are doing our current study again kind of as a two by two. So um, uh, the, the, the medication side of that isn't done yet, but um, be, in the medication study we are doing the intracortical myelin measures. They're not fully processed yet, but um, we do have that data on almost all of those patients. So eventually we'll be able to do that. Turns out intercortical myelin has to be scored. The nice thing is it's a wonderful new technique that was designed at UCLA and very few people know how to do it. Uh, the, the bad thing is it takes about 17 hours to score one MRI by hand um, uh, to get intracortical myelin. And we have to train people for several months to be reliable. So we're looking for automated ways to do this, um, but it always lags behind the other analyses. Um, now, should you go exercising before I tell you whether there were any intracortical myelin effects or should you go after? Um, I think this, uh, we'd, I'll tell you what we did, but I can't advise you about your gym habits. Um, the, uh, what we did is there is some literature that suggests that the effect temporarily for like a couple hours um, is stronger than the, long, than the effect over days. But there's other literature that suggests that once you're in a regular exercise routine, you start building um, cumulative effects. So um, the answer is sort of in between. Um, what we did is we put the cognitive training session in the middle 
Um, no, sorry. We put the exercise session in the middle because it was only one, and we had cognitive training before and after exercise on the same day. And we're doing some supplementary analyses that aren't done yet, so I don't know the result, to see whether there, you actually learned more in those two, one of those cognitive sessions than the other. But it's hard in single sessions like that to get differential cognitive effects, but we were interested in that. Um, the, um, so, you know, if you can get up in the morning and get to the gym early and then read the newest journal article, um, maybe your retention and learning would be, you'd benefit from both the temporary and the cumulative effects. Um, probably more important that you get up early at least four times a week and uh, get in some exercise. Thank you for yeah. <laughs> um, on the first question, cognitive training, um, as Sophia and her group and others have shown, clearly works in chronic patients. Um, whether it works exactly as well or not quite as well, that's, I think, still open to debate. Um, it may depend on what style of cognitive training you do and other factors. Some of us believe you might get somewhat larger effects in first episode patients, but you get notable clinically meaningful effects in chronic patients. So. Um, it's clear that cognitive training would be a good thing for almost everyone with schizophrenia. Now, how do you get it to the masses? Well, probably the first thing you do is you make it internet-based, which it is now for posit science. So all of us can go up, go in and sign up for the cognitive training. Um, now, how do you um, get patients to do it? That's a much trickier problem. Um, the, um, the cognitive training that we know, uh, we have the best uh, scientific base for um, working well is unfortunately not the cognitive training that's the most fun. Um, so, you know, th that's a dilemma that hopefully over time the developers of uh, cognitive training we know has a strong scientific base will make that cognitive training more fun, and it's getting more fun. But, you know, it's like if you tell a patient, well, you could either go play, um, I don't play video games, so, you know, some popular video game, or you can do a cognitive training that will enhance your um, auditory processing, verbal memory, and problem solving. And they go try them both, and it's based on sheer enjoyment. They'll play video games. Um, so it needs to be structured into our interventions so that maybe we do it at the clinic. We've had uh, better success doing it at the clinic um, because we can control the environment and um, control the computers for that matter. Um, and, you know, we don't have a great deal of problem getting patients to do cognitive training in the clinic. Getting them to do it at home, we haven't tried as much, Sophia has, but um, it's trickier. Some patients are really motivated and do a great job, and others, um, it's hard to keep them on task. But it's definitely an effective treatment that we should use more. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, I... I think myelination problems in schizophrenia are, um, are critical and are certainly worth following up and thinking more about how we can intervene to um, prevent the sort of, it's either demyelization or not maintaining myelin um, in the brain at multiple levels. I don't think that the intracortical myelin problem explains all of the traditional white matter, DTI kind of um, tractography kinds of um, results, because those are about traditional white matter uh, deeper in the brain. Um, this is, 
the cortical thickness, um, it's real hard to tell in traditional studies um, looking at cortical thickness. We're actually trying to do this right now with like traditional method like free surfer and see if it's related to um, what we measure as intracortical myelin changes. Um, but those methods might be affected by this moving boundary between um, full, gray mat full gray matter, kind of myelin myelinated gray matter and traditional white matter. Because that boundary sort of moves a bit depending on technique. Um, so uh, w we've been thinking about that and thinking whether like reduced cortical thickness in schizophrenia is um, is related and uh, we don't know yet. I, there are um, no studies that I know of that directly compare those techniques. We're trying to do it now with a sample that we've collected over time of about 80 patients. So you have to invite me back next year. Got it. Um, the, the main intervention here was um, at six months. I mean, it was six months long, so that's what I showed you. Um, we saw improvements at three and six months. We have um, partial data at 12 months. Um, we haven't fully analyzed that. I mean, to the extent that I've looked at it, um, it's on a partial sample so far. Um, it shows um, sort of some uh, tendency for the effect to last but it's not as large at 12 months as it was at six months. So um, it's not, and you know, only some of the people continued to do any exercise. So we're, we also have measures of how much exercise they do. We have to try to relate those. Right, right. Um, on a different measure, we did collect those data, but we um, as I said, this is a very recently completed study. We haven't analyzed that measure yet. So we'll, we can look at that. Um, my preference is for this kind of rating scale for this reason. Um, this kind of rating scale combines whether you go back to work or school, which is in some ways a very coarse kind of, yes, it matters, but, um, but if you go back to work or school and you do a terrible job at it, um, that's not a great outcome either. So um, this combines the quality of your work school performance and the quantity. So at the lower levels, very low levels, you're not going to work or school at all. But at the upper levels, it's measuring when you're going back to work or school, how well are you doing? So um, I like that kind of combination, although we have ways to tease it apart as well that we haven't looked at yet. You haven't met some of them. If the last thing you said, if I heard correctly, was billing for it, I I can't address that. Yeah, yeah. Certainly, you could recommend it. Whether you can bill for it, I have no expertise. But yes, yes. Yeah, so um, let me deal with the motivation issue because I think that's um, a serious uh, issue that you have to cope with um, systematically. So it's not like all our patients are saying, oh, wonderful, just give me whatever intervention and I'll do it. Um, most of them are, th it's a very typical, I mean, first episode patients maybe are a bit more motivated than very chronic patients, but. Um, lots of them, you know, are very hesitant to do things that would be good for them. Um, and um, we have to always work on that. So like in the exercise program, we have, first of all, for their home exercise, which it's harder to get them to do, we pay them $5 for every um, home exercise they do where they're in the right heart rate zone. Um, then we have a contest um, amongst the patients where they get points. They get points for exercising in the clinic and at home. They get points for um, being in the right heart rate zone. 
They get points for um, helping to motivate others in the group. So then we have a competition. And then we have a reward, uh, which currently is uh, a special lunch given for this patient um, who wins every month. With a, someone wins. Um, uh, the, um, all these sort of external motivators seem to help. Um, even patients with um, some negative symptoms um, seem to respond to, uh, in the group exercise, they respond to seeing other people exercise. Um, and they'll usually go ahead and exercise in the group. Getting them to exercise at home at the appropriate level is harder, but, um, but can be done. The other thing that we've done with the exercise one is when they go home, if they don't want to do the um, exercises we've, treat, we've trained them to do, but they have a favorite exercise that they like to do, play basketball, you know, jogging uh, or whatever, if they're willing to wear the heart rate monitor and show us that they're in the right heart rate zone, we let them tailor the exercise at home to what they want to do. So we try to fit it in to their lifestyle. We're really trying to get them to start a, a lifestyle change. So we're hoping that they can do something they'll continue to do after the study is over. So that's the kinds of things we've done. Uh, I haven't any experience in um, getting um, children to exercise. Um, when I was a child, I loved exercising, but... Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> times have changed. Um, I think there's evidence for all of those elements that you just talked about, um, including uh, music stimulates certain pathways in the brain that are you know, are not necessarily stimulated by like verbal material. So especially having to do with uh, sequencing effects and sort of uh, mathematical relationship-like effects. So I think it's very interesting. Um, uh, the other things are all fields where effects have been demonstrated. Um, uh, I'm not sure about rap music yet, <laughs> but you know, it might be a generational thing. Yeah, we did. Um, uh, we got, um, let me see if I remember, because it wasn't the primary target. We got um, some decrease in uh, blood pressure. I think it's in systolic, not diastolic, but I, I'm not sure. Um, we. We were hoping that we would get like BMI um, redu reduction, but um, we did no nutrition training. And um, we did not get BMI differential reduction. It was in the right direction, but wasn't close to significant. Um, and um, when you do this kind of research, it's a good idea to have a certified fitness trainer kind of close. And we happen to have one who was also a PhD in neuroscience, Sarah McEwen. Um, now we have a different certified fitness trainer. But when I talked to her about that effect, she said, well, you know, Keith, we, we showed that we improved strength, not only aerobic conditioning. And what does improving strength do? It builds muscle. Muscle weighs at least as much as fat. So unless you also do a dietary component, you probably will not get um, some metabolic effects, especially weight reduction and so on. And we did not. But I think that you might be able to, there's a researcher at Montreal right now who has just shown um, a waist circumference changes um, with uh, an exercise program. But she told me that uh, many of their, they're in a first episode clinic where nutrition train, training is also available. So it may be that it's the combination. Um, I'm trying to remember, we also did things like um, uh, overall cholesterol, LDL, HDL, and so on. I know we did not get significant differential effects on those, but I don't remember uh, the exact findings. 
Um, by six months, I'm uh, looking into space because I have good visual imagery and I'm pulling up the, the printout. Um, <clears throat> by six months, I would say we got rid of about half of the cognitive deficit, which is better than we were doing with cognitive remediation alone, where it was like a quarter to a third. But, um, you know, there is still a ways to go. Um, but this is enough so that you get very meaningful changes in everyday functioning. So certainly in terms of, um, I can't speak to what you can be reimbursed to do, but you should be reimbursed to do these treatments because th these are real life meaningful differences. Um, there's still a ways to go. So um, that's good because most of us who do this research don't like unemployment. Um, I'll tell you what it's not due to, but I can't answer exactly that question. Um, and it's a very good question. I can tell you we do have the data, but I haven't looked at it that way yet. But um, what we did do, we knew we would get a question like, is it the amount of um, reduction in psychotic symptoms from baseline to that point, or is it the reduction in negative symptoms? So that we had clearly measured at baseline in six months, and it's not. If you co-vary those different patients differ uh, to uh, varying degrees on how much reduction. If you co-vary that, it doesn't change the findings. There's still the same medication adherence effect. Now, um, your question um, is is really excellent, and it's almost exactly the same question that Christoph Corell asked me. And um, and uh, unfortunately, in between him asking me and you just asking me, I haven't been able to go back to the data. But we do every two week brief psychiatric rating scales, and we can detect sort of periods, brief periods of psychotic symptoms. So I think we have to do something like scale the number of times somebody went back up into the clinically significant range. Because I agree with you that that's a logical question. Are you really protecting the, uh, the brain against injury? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you.